Good morning. Welcome to St. John's Lutheran Church in Poughkeepsie, New York, and our virtual worship series. This video is for Sunday, June 9th, 2024, which is the third Sunday after Pentecost. Thank you for tuning in this morning. I'm glad you're here. Now let's take a moment to frame our hearts and minds before God as we get ready to worship today. Okay, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. All-powerful God, in Jesus Christ, you turned death into life and defeat into victory. Bolster our faith that we may find strength in the unity of the Holy Spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns together with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to read you two readings this morning. I'm going to grab the first reading and the gospel. The first reading is from Genesis, uh, in the third chapter, beginning at the eighth verse. <clears throat> Adam and Eve heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of God among the trees of the garden. But God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And God said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent tricked me, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And the um, gospel now from St. Mark in the third chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus went home, and the crowd came together again so that Jesus and the disciples could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for the people were saying, He has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he has Beelzebul, and by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. And he called them to him and spoke to them in parables, saying, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then indeed the house can be plundered. Truly, I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Well, and this gospel is it's kind of a bizarre reading, right? And and a bizarre scene. But um and one of my favorite parts actually in this is the very end where Jesus is um sitting around with the crowd and the people come to him and say, Hey, uh, Jesus, you know, your mom is calling. Have <laughs> you ever done that when you want to get rid of somebody? Hey, isn't your mom calling you? <laughs> so I love that part. Um but as weird as this text seems, it actually um it's the beginning of Mark, and as we go through Jesus' life and ministry, 
all the stuff that happens today actually becomes, unfortunately, pretty typical. Um, and here's why. Because Jesus' popularity made everybody uncomfortable. His teachings made everyone uncomfortable. He was rocking the boat. And and here it is. They said that he's gone out of his mind. They thought he was crazy. <laughs> his family, that is. So, you know, why is that? I mean, or more importantly, why why just his family and, and, and the religious leaders? Why didn't the crowd around him think he was crazy? Why did the whole crowd see his power, but not those who were closest to him? You know? Um, and it's funny, you know, I mean... Here are the first three words are probably the 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 uh, the the worst the dumbest part of the whole gospel. Um, three words: Jesus went home. <laughs> you can't go home. You just can't go home because this is it. His family had expected him to just be Jesus, the carpenter's son. They had different expectations than the crowds did. They wanted him to play his role as brother, son, tradesman. Right? They just wanted him to be Jesus. They didn't want him to be Jesus the Christ, right? His religious leaders wanted him to play by the rules. They wanted him to be a good rabbi, you know, and just not rock the boat because now he's threatening their whole structure, threatening their power, threatening their own um, livelihoods and their own expectations, their own roles and their own, you know, uh, he was threatening his family's expectations. Both groups couldn't see the forest for the trees. You know, they just couldn't. And and so often we see that happen. You know, you go home and when you go home, it's just like you were four years old again, you know, or six or eight, depending on where, you, you know, and there it is. Uh, so it's pretty normal, actually, uh, unfortunately. And it's funny that his family <laughs> thinks he's crazy, too. Um, you know, and it's, it's, you know, it's not that his family and the religious leaders, um, couldn't comprehend what Jesus was doing. It is that they did not want to comprehend what Jesus was doing. There's a difference there. They didn't want to accept who Jesus really was. So his response um, to all of that, when he talks to the scribes and his family, um, you know, he says, he says, you know, it's not possible. I'm not working with Satan because Satan can't cast out Satan. If I was Satan, I wouldn't be able to cast out demons, right? It's pretty obvious. But, you know, a house divided itself against itself can't stand, he says. You know, and, and yet and yet here he is at home and his own family is divided against itself against him. How can that stand? You know, it's not surprising that he says, look, the crowd around me is my family. Because they are not working against me. They're working with me here. You know, uh, I don't know. So what is it that divides a household um, or a family, you know, or a kingdom, you know, because against itself? I mean, and, and I'll tell you where the answer to that is in the first read. That's why I read you the first read. What divides a household or a family or an organization or a religion or anything against itself is all the way back there in Genesis um, and what Luther calls original sin. And here it is. Um, remember, the fruit that Adam and Eve ate, um, that original sin that got him kicked out of the garden forever, that fruit was from the tree of the knowledge of the difference between good and evil. So not the tree of wisdom, like a lot of people say, or the tree of life or the tree of knowledge, but specifically the tree of the knowledge of the difference between good and evil, which is then that tree is the tree that gives them the knowledge and the power to discern and to judge. In other words, that ability to tell good from evil made them God. Or so they thought, you know. So, and, and here's here's the funny thing. Once they tasted that ability to discern, the backfire of the whole thing is that now they themselves became vulnerable. Think about it. 
that's the point of the image of nakedness. It's like, oh, they discovered they're naked. Well, because nakedness is, is the definition and the metaphor for shame in, in Jewish culture, right? So um, up until this moment, up until the moment they ate that fruit, they did not know shame. They just knew each other. And they just knew happiness. You know, now suddenly they eat that fruit and they're immediately launched into this trajectory of knowing or at least figuring out what's right and what's wrong. And, and what do the, what's the first thing they do? They run and they hide because now suddenly they are afraid of being judged. Yesterday, they weren't afraid of God. Today, they're terrified. As it turned out, wanting to know everything that God knew was way more complicated and dangerous than they were capable of understanding. And I love this quote from William Brown in, in his commentary on this text. I love this quote. It's one of my favorite quotes of all time in commentaries. He wrote, unwittingly, in their choice to become fully divine, they actually became fully human. And now, vulnerable, capable of feeling fear and shame um, in an effort to protect their own interests, right? Which is, now, this is something they wouldn't have done before they ate the fruit, trying to protect their own interests, right? They're hiding from God. And when God says, what exactly happened here? Now they have to protect themselves. And they are now, by virtue of having eaten that fruit, are suddenly, inevitably, and irrevocably I can't even say the word, irrevocably stuck in the blame game, right? Adam now blames Eve. Then he blames God. He says, you know, that woman that you gave to me, it's your fault, God, because you gave her to me, right? So he blames Eve, then he blames God, you know, and, and, and Eve, in turn, blames the serpent. <laughs> oh, and, and there's the other thing that comes with this original sin, of wanting the power to be able to discern good from evil, right? Besides the blame, the other thing that comes from this all is expectation. The fundamental to des desire to be able to distinguish good from bad creates all this power and judgment and expectation and shame and vulnerability. None of that would have ever happened if they had just listened to God. None of this would ever happen in our world if we would just love everything that God created as much as God loves everything that God created. See, there's no fear when there is no expectation. There is no vulnerability when there is no judgment. There is no need to hide when there is nothing but love. There is no need to point fingers or exclude or, or you know, I, there's no need for any of that. Now, Jesus couldn't go home because of all of that, because his family was too wrapped up in their own quest to determine whether Jesus was good or bad. And the religious leaders have now decided in their infinite wisdom, because they can discern and distinguish because of original sin, right? They know that Jesus is bad and they are good. <laughs> And there is the problem with every single religion on the planet, isn't it? <laughs> they had defined in their own minds what Jesus was supposed to be like, what was supposed to be his role, and, and what was supposed to be God's role. And not just religious leaders, but Jesus' own family had made up their minds. And Jesus was never going to escape that. If all those people had simply loved Jesus and appreciated what he was doing, there wouldn't have been a threat because he wasn't trying to usurp them. He was trying to enhance them. If the scribes had simply rejected Jesus, they might have heard a whole new way to interpret the scriptures and do their jobs, which is to interpret scripture. <laughs> Instead, they were afraid of losing something like popularity or power. Or what, so they invoked their discernment power card by saying they know for sure what's the difference between good and evil and Jesus is absolutely evil, they say. You know, what's so crazy about this is, isn't that what Satan does? 
I mean, isn't Satan's whole MO, right, to create division and expectation and threat and doubt and fear and shame and all the things that come with you wanting to know who's good and who's bad and who's right and who's wrong, who's deserving and who has an unclean spirit? And imagine Jesus saying, by the way, that the, he says there's an unforgivable sin, and if he says it, it must be true, and that unforgivable sin is to tell somebody that they have an unclean spirit. Um, his, we're, we don't know for sure, but when we start saying that people have unclean spirits and that people are evil, we're doing the one thing that he said you should never do. Power, leverage, shame, expectation, those are the definition of judgment. And they are what divide people. Scribes perceived threat instead of truth. Jesus' family perceived renegade instead of relative. The division between Adam and Eve and between Adam and Eve and God, that division, how could Adam throw Eve under the bus? I'm sorry, how could he do that? <laughs> that whole division happened because there was suddenly doubt. There was suddenly mistrust. There was suddenly pride. There was suddenly jealousy. Instead of simple compassion and love, you know, God wasn't worried about good versus evil. The beginning of the Genesis text tells us he was simply strolling through the garden and enjoying the evening breeze. That's all. Jesus wasn't trying to eradicate evil. Otherwise, he would have destroyed Satan in the first 40 days in the wilderness. You know, the answer to all the evil stuff is God saying to Adam and Eve, don't worry about it. Don't eat that fruit. You don't need to know. It's okay. I got it. I'm in charge. And Jesus himself says, hey, you know what? I am the solution. I am. And I am the solution to overcome evil rather than destroying it. So I'm not sure why we humans make such a fulcrum of our own discipleship is this, this sort of quest to discover who's good and who's bad, right? Jesus himself says that pure love is the hinge on which everything opens. Pure love alone is the hinge upon which every door of relationship opens. You know, we don't have to be a house divided like they were on that day. We don't have to worry about anything except loving everyone, the Christ, the way Christ loved and loves us. We don't need to figure out the difference between anything. You know, we don't, we don't have to get it all turned around like Adam and Eve did, or like the scribes, or like Jesus' family did. We don't have to do that. Although there is one thing that we really should and can turn around, and that is Evil, because evil, reversed, is live. So live the love of Christ. Anything else is just backwards. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now, may the peace of the Lord be with you always. Take a moment to share that peace, that actual peace of God with the people sitting next to you, along with you watching this morning. Um, make a call, send a text, go outside, talk to a neighbor. You know, share the peace of God, the unity of the Holy Spirit. A house divided can't stand, but neighbors who are compassionate with each other and finding the unity that exists in love and dignity and creation. You never know how strong that can become. Speaking of strength, let's find some strength using the words that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon each one of you with favor and grant you peace. Amen. And remember, you are the body of Christ, raised up for that world. So go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you for joining me this morning. I hope you have a a wonderful and faith-filled week. I look forward to seeing you right here on video or right over there in church next Sunday. God bless you all.